I don't associate taking performance enhancing drugs with immaturity. I generally would ascribe that to stupidity. Um, but I'm not at all, you know, bothered by the suspension. I'm certainly bothered by what appears to be a very selfish act on the behalf of Tatis to do something like that. Um, the team paid you a tremendous amount of money and made a enormous commitment to you. And, you know, you, you failed the team. And I'm joined now by my dear friend, Carl Ravitch, the voice of all things baseball at ESPN, baseball tonight, Sunday night, baseball, college world series. And this week, the little league world series. I cannot wait. Um, Ravi, how you doing? You're playing golf today. I got all that covered uh, and golf today. Yes, we're going to go to one of the great courses in America, Tim. We're going to go play Wingfoot at a charity event. So we're really looking forward to that. It's been a good week. It's actually been a good summer, um, given all the stuff we've, we've done. So we're excited about today and we cannot wait to see you in Williamsport because you become a different man in Williamsport. For people yeah. that don't know Tim, he's, <laughs> he, he finds a new level. And I, 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 got a, I got a tweet last night, Tim, after the game, from somebody kind enough to recognize, you know, how much they miss you on our, on our broadcast and in our booth. So we're going to do our best to make sure we can get our booth back together with me, you and Eduardo Perez and have a good laugh at it. I, I described you as a treasure. Do you think that was fair? Are you a treasure? <laughs> no, we'll leave that out. By the way, Ravi's like a three. He's one of the great putters I've ever been around. And even though he'll be up against it at wing foot today, a three is a three. Pretty darn good. All right, enough of that, Ravi. Let's start with last night. Two hours and 15 minutes. What happened? <laughs> I said to David Cohn when we were about to sign off, I said, I think I'm going to have to ask you to stay. I, I felt like that was six innings, not nine. It felt a little bit like a Little League World Series game. Look, you know, they, they, they got ahead. Walker pitched a great game. He hadn't pitched since June 28th. He mixed and matched his pitches. He threw change-ups into Aaron Judge. He threw fastballs down. He threw fastballs up. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a work of art, uh, really, from a pitching perspective. And let's be honest, the Yankees lineup was depleted last night. There's obviously no Giancarlo Stanton. D.J. LeMahieu was out with a foot-slash-toe injury they're going to deal with today. So all, all, the, all the factors were in play for walking to have success and he's been really good when he's been healthy but I don't think anybody expected that and that's the other thing we learned Tim you know Aaron Boone realized we got a 10 game lead we're down three zip I have a bullpen that I'm not quite sure of so we're going to send Jamison Tyone back out there for the sixth and seventh innings he got through them without any problem which is another reminder sometimes starting pitchers do have the ability to go more than five innings or six that's really what helped the game move along is you didn't have a lot of bullpen arms coming in and until the seventh inning. Both starters were great, and that's what gives you a two-hour and 15-minute game if you're lucky. Right. So Judge is now 0 for 14 with nine strikeouts yeah. lifetime against Waka, which is really weird. Did the the Red Sox find anything out about Judge this weekend? I, he's the MVP. He's having an unbelievable year, but they pitched him really well. What was their thinking there? Well, I, you know, Buster and I discussed this last week when he was incredulous. Buster's known to be incredulous. I think you know <laughs> that at times. So he was incredulous about this this willingness for anybody, and in this case, the Red Sox, to pitch to Aaron Judge. He he really was mind blown. Like, why is anybody doing that? And we spoke to Alex Cora before the game yesterday, and I asked him about the Friday night situation. First base was open. Judge was up. They ended up walking him, but not intentionally. They were intending to pitch to him. And, and look, uh, my point to Buster, and you can tell me if you agree with this or not, is that given all the advancement that, that teams have for their pitchers, whether it's in a lab, whether it's all the advanced metrics, spin rate, blah, 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 they can identify a hitter's weakness. And if you, Tim Kirkshen, execute this pitch, you're going to get anybody out. It doesn't matter if it's Ruth, Bonds, or in this case, Aaron Judge. If you do that, you're going to get them out. Meaning they have, they believe they have the answers to these offensive tests. And Alex Gore is of the mind. If Michael Walker executes 
We know where we can pitch Aaron Judge or how to pitch Aaron Judge. We have the advantage in our favor to get him out. And I don't know that they're alone in that. I do believe most teams have the belief. We got all the information. If you go out there and do what you're supposed to do, which, again, eliminates all of the human aspect to this thing, the 50,000 people, the pressure, et cetera, et cetera, that's where the gray area comes. Like, ooh, he didn't execute, and the ball ended up on the mass turnpike. So they pitched to him. I don't think they figured out something no other team is aware of. I just think that they have confidence. If you execute the game plan as a pitcher, there's a good chance you're going to be able to have success. Uh, switching gears a little, Ravi, the game plan for the Padres has now changed because Fernando Tatis Jr. has been suspended for 80 games. So where are you on the Padres, on Tatis, and the reaction to his suspension? Yeah, um, look, I mean, the one thing, and we've had a number of Padres games on Sunday night, the, the kind of recurring theme that you heard from – members of the organization was we're going to get him back. We're really looking forward to it. He's a great player. There's just some immaturity issues and I don't associate taking performance enhancing drugs with immaturity. I generally would ascribe that to stupidity, Um, but I'm not at all, you know, bothered by the suspension. I'm certainly bothered by what appears to be a very selfish act on the behalf of Tatis to do something like that. Um, the team paid you a tremendous amount of money and made an enormous commitment to you. And, you know, you have, you failed the team. You've let your teammates down. I don't buy any of the excuses. I don't buy any player who thinks that they can get away with saying, I wasn't sure what I put in my body, et cetera. I don't buy any of that. I think you're very well aware as a professional athlete at the highest level, what it is that you are putting into your body. So it's a, it's just, like everybody, it's frustrating. It's disappointing. Um, it's crushing on a lot of levels that somebody, you know, who's coming back would do that. And then, look, Tim, you have to ask yourself: was was maybe the reason that the recovery was slow uh, was because he needed something else to help get him there? You, you never know what the heck goes on in somebody's mind. But again, I think it does go back to the same question we've asked many times about the alleged. And those that admitted using performance enhancing drugs, you sign a massive deal. You're taken care of forever. It doesn't appear as if Fernando Tatis Jr. was using anything prior to that contract. But you ask somebody, was it worth it to those that either got away with it, cheated and made boatloads of money and are set for their life and the rest of their lives? That's a that's a question that I think, you know, you only you know, can only look at the guy in the mirror and say, was it worth it? Do I care? Was it was it too much to get caught and have to live with the Hester Prynne scarlet letter or did I win? I'm good for the rest of my life and I'll try to repair my image later. I, I, I don't know, but that's one of the conversation pieces that comes as a result of something like this. All right, we're going to pivot out of that. Thankfully, um, let's get on. Well, you are you? Well, you. I mean, you're a you're a you know you're a pallbearer for Major League Baseball. You know, you're a you're a pillar here. What was your take on all that? How frustrated? How disappointing? How sad are you when something like I, that happens to a big name? Yeah, I'm sad, Ravi. I'm not mad. I mean, I'm disappointed at, at Fernando Tatis Jr. His teammates are mad at him, from what I can tell. Mike Clevenger, Manny Machado. Uh, AJ Preller, they were had some pretty pointed comments. It just bothers me. It worries me. This guy is one of the best players in the game and one of the faces of baseball. And then he goes and does this. This is a bad day for baseball more than anything. I mean, has there been a bigger suspension other than maybe Alex Rodriguez for a whole season? We were supposed to be past this. And now we get 80 games for one of the bright young stars in the game who signed for $340 million. That's what worries me is a face of the game gets suspended like this. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of that, look, I think people, people rightly or wrongly are now going to say to themselves, well, has this stuff been going on the whole time? Is that why he's so great? Again, none of this stuff is fair, but none of this stuff gets asked unless you create this situation. Right. It's fair to ask it now. All right. Let's get on to the Little League World Series. Ravi, when I went there for the first time, 
eight years ago, you told me this will be the greatest event you've ever covered. I didn't believe you. And then I did one year and said, this is the greatest event I've ever covered. What is it, Ravi, for you that makes this event so special? All right. So Tuesday, I will get in the car and make the five hour drive. And, you know, it's a long ride. But, you know, at the end of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold. And as soon as you pull into that little town, and you see those two fields, you, you get a chill. You realize like, this is such a unique experience. And, and I think it's important to quantify uh, what the Little League World Series is relative to baseball. This is not the Major League Baseball World Series. This is different than watching the greatest players in the world do things on the biggest stage at the apex of the Major League Baseball season. This is different. This takes that energy. It takes the enthusiasm of the youth of America. It combines it with kids from across the globe who are all speaking the language of baseball. No other place do you get that combination. And this is the mad scientist in the room who's created what is a euphoric experience for anybody that likes baseball. And the reason we all like baseball, Tim, is not because Rafael Devers can hit a ball 434 feet, because we can't do that. But we can all relate to a 10, 11, 12-year-old boy or girl picking up a glove, grabbing a ball, asking a friend to go play catch with them, getting eight, nine, ten kids from the neighborhood to play a baseball game when there's no right fielder so you can't hit it to right field we've all had this shared experience and here you go into Williamsport and you're sharing this same experience with the uh, dad or mom sitting next to you on the couch while your son or daughter is laying on the floor and they're watching these kids do something that you you know you, you look at and you be like wow I did that when I was a kid I never was fortunate enough to get to that place but Boy, does that look fun. That's the whole key is the fun aspect of this thing. And I know I beat that drum. It's fun. The kids have fun. It, it just offers perspective. We're sitting here talking about BS PEDs with major league players. Thankfully, that's never been an issue with an 11 or 12 year old kid. And you, you've got people from Taipei and Japan and Italy and Australia and Puerto Rico, Tennessee. You know, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, wherever they may be, all sitting there playing a game that you and I, you know, have such an intimate relationship with. And it's a reminder, this is good. This is everything that's good about baseball. Do you have a favorite moment or two from all the years that you covered this, whether it's Monet Davis or whatever along the way? Yeah, I, you know, the Monet Davis moments shine because you recognize, I remember early because we had seen her in Connecticut at the regionals. And I remember telling, you know, Matt Sanduli, who was in charge of the Little League World Series at that point, a good friend of ours who now works for the uh, New York Mets and SNY. I said, Matt, we're going to have to do a Sunday conversation with Monet Davis uh, when we get to Williamsport because she was such a unique story. You knew that this was way bigger than the Little League World Series. It was way bigger than Little League Baseball. This is a, a seminal moment. You have a black girl pitching at the highest level on a national stage, really a global stage, who's very well-spoken, who's incredibly athletic. We, we've got to make sure people out there get a chance to be exposed to who Monet Davis is as a person beyond who she is as a baseball player. Good Morning America, all the national morning shows ended up kind of figuring out, we, we got to get to Williamsport. We need to do more on this story. She, she was unique that way. The moments that stand out, though, are when, you know, Dave Belisle brought the Cumberland Valley, Rhode Island team there, a couple of, uh, the Cumberland, Rhode Island team there a couple of years. And there was this kid, Tim Tebow, and he was he was not a starter, but they had used this TiVo time concept every every game because every kid's got to get in, every kid's got to bat. So you know, late in the game, it would be TiVo time, and they would all clap, and TiVo would come off the bench, and lo and behold, he he'd come up with a big hit. And, and again, to see the 
the team rally around him to see Belial's enthusiasm when Tebow got a hit, to see what it meant to Tebow standing there at first base, looking back at his bench, you know, with one of these, th- those types of moments are where I get, ch- where I get chills and they happen all the time. You know, that's the beauty of the game too. Right. Ravi, the little league classic there has added another great dimension to Williamsport. I just love it when the big leaguers come to Williamsport, the look on their faces. Some, Most of them have never been there before. The right. interaction with the kids is just unbelievable. Chris Archer went there a few years ago with the Pirates. He had had a difficult season to that point, and one of the kids came up to him and said, Aren't you the guy that gives up all the home runs? <laughs> Chris Archer said, yeah, I'm the guy that gives up all the home runs. How much has the big league, little league classic meant to the whole experience in Williamsport? Well, it, mean, it means everything to the kids that are there for sure. And I know that the viewers at home who get a chance to see those looks on the faces of the major leaguers and the kids, I mean, this is all out of the mouths of babes when you have kids. And we've started to do this, believe it or not, uh, on Sunday night very effectively when we ask people at home to send in a question that we can ask whoever is wearing the microphone or the earpiece. And you recognize that the people at home don't, don't necessarily have those filters that you would have or I would have or Coney or Eduardo in asking a player a question. And right away, even last night, Tim, the first question that somebody wanted to ask Labor Torres so how many home runs is Aaron Judge going to hit this year? You know, that's we're not going to put him on the spot. That's a, kind of an uncomfortable, but the person at home didn't care, so they asked it. So when you see those interactions and you talk about Chris Archer and a kid saying, aren't you the guy that gives up all the home runs, it's, it's wonderful. You think about Alex Cora. I mean, if there's somebody who's experienced just about everything in baseball, wouldn't you think it's Alex Cora? Like everything, right? He's done it all. I mean, he's worked for us. <clears throat> he's seen the globe. I said, Alex, your Red Sox are coming to Williamsport. How many times have you been there? Never. He's never been to Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So Alex Cora is going to be in Williamsport with the Red Sox, mingling with the team from Puerto Rico. Uh, he, he, he is really anxious. I mean, all of them, Francona, anybody that we've ever worked with who's gone there, leaves with this. It's almost as if you get that spirit rekindled again. Somebody lights that flame if you've at all soured on the game of baseball. When you see the Little Leaguers, it rejuvenates you, reinvigorates you. Oh, my gosh. This Now I remember what this is all about. Cora's has never been there. He actually said, I got I to gotta call my mom. I think we have a picture because I think Joey went to Williamsport when he was a kid and played, remember his dad started the little league chapter in the town he grew up in. He thinks that Joey played in Williamsport. He's going to look for a picture, but he's never been there. Right. Remember Tito Francona told us the one year he worked at ESPN when he was negotiating his contract with ESPN, he said, I'm not taking the job with you guys unless I get to work the Williamsport World Series, which was so cool. As he put it, it's baseball meets the county fair. And it's so cool. Now, Ravi, you're the voice of Sunday Night Baseball, and now you're going to be calling a Little League game on Sunday and then a Major League game on Sunday night. How cool is that going to be for you to call a Little League and a Big League game on the same day? It's it's going to be a reminder how different the two games are. I mean, um, You know, I I think one thing we do with the Little League World Series sometimes is because we emphasize fun sportsmanship. If they make a bad play, look at the sportsmanship. They're going to go up the hill to the Grove where they all stay together in the bunks and and say, hey, that's no big deal. We're over it. We're going to go play ping pong. I think sometimes we dismiss, and I know you can speak to this, how darn good these Little Leaguers actually are. And we're, we're fortunate. Because anybody that's ever coached Little League like we have or seen Little League games, they're not all played at the level of the teams that get to Williamsport. However, the teams that get to Williamsport are really, really excellent teams. I mean, wait till you see the the best player from Honolulu this year, who's a pitcher who looks like he could play college baseball now. That's, That's how talented and skilled these kids are. So sometimes we take that for granted. But the Little League during the day and then the major leaguers at night with the speed and the size and the power they're two great contrasts 
uh, in one in one day. But again, it's still a bat. It's still a ball. It's still a glove. You still got to make the pitches. You still got to make the plays. Just a really neat experience to be able to call two two same games and two very different games. Right. And I'm with you on the skill level, Ravi, especially those middle infielders watching yeah. their footwork around the bag. And the catchers. The Oh, the catchers are great. It is so impressive. You know, in Little League, you can have a big kid just overwhelms everyone because he's bigger and stronger. But when you see these kids who are that skilled, especially around the bag and especially behind the plate, that's what really, really does it for me. All right, I'm going to leave you with this, Ravi. I, I know Kyle Peterson's with us, and there is nobody, and I mean nobody better than Kyle Peterson at this. He is so playful. He is so much fun, and yet he gets it better than anyone. But this year, We've got Eduardo Perez, our dear friend, coming to to Williamsport for the first time. He's never been there, as far as I know. He certainly never called a game from there. What what what's that going to be like when Eddie joins us in Williamsport? Eddie's going to be like everybody else. David Cohn has never been there. David Cohn's going for the first time. David Cohn has five World Series rings. David Cohn's going to have an experience he's never had in baseball before. He's a dad. He knows what it means. Uh, again, dad, mom, uncle, grandfather, the ability to relate to what an 11 or 12-year-old is going through because you went through that when you were 11 or 12, and your entire perspective changes on what they're dealing with and how they're dealing with it and whether they make a great play or they mis misjudge a high pop. The empathy that you have, the willingness to celebrate, uh, they will – they will, like Terry Francona, say, I want to go back next year. I, I, I want to. We, we're, we're, we've gone to London to cover Major League Baseball games. London is an incredible experience. I guarantee you, as much as people enjoy going to London, those that love baseball, Francona, Cohn, Eduardo, yourself, are going to say, I right, give the choice. I, I like to go back to Williamsport. I, I'll go back to London on a vacation, but I, I want to see this group of kids come from around the world, all gather in one place, and just watch baseball starting at 1 in the afternoon, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. You know, I've had so many people here where I live, Tim, walk up, and, and now that the regionals have been televised, tell me, oh, my gosh, did you see that? They're playing today. Did you see the play that the kid just made from Iowa? Did you watch that game with New Hampshire? Uh, it, it doesn't happen very often. With the major leaguers, there's just an introduction of another group of fans when it's the Little League World Series. And they do it every year, and it's amazing. It's like binge-watching for, as we start on Wednesday and go through Sunday, you binge-watch for that period of time. And then Monday comes, you you flip on ESPN, and, and you're like, wait, where, where do the Little Leaguers go? What happened? It ended on Sunday, and there's an enormous letdown. A lot of people look forward to it as much as we do to get there to watch it. It's kind of like the end of the summer. You're gliding right into September. It's it's a really big deal, and it's consistent. It's every year, and it never fails to deliver. I'm with you on that. Let's leave it there, Ravi. I will see you tomorrow. Travel safely to Williamsport and hit him well today at Wingfoot. All right, my friend. All right. See you soon. See you. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.